Hi, this is Mike Fry with No Kill Learning, and this is No Kill in Motion, your monthly podcast of the goings on in the no kill movement. With Aubrey Cavanaugh, author, advocate, and founder of No Kill Huntsville, Alan Rosenberg, the New Jersey Animal Observer, and of course, David Smith, the president of No Kill Colorado. Today, our panel is taking questions from viewers across the country about how they can reform animal shelters in their own communities. You're not going to want to miss a minute of this. Hi, and we're back with No Kill in Motion. And today I'm excited because we've got questions from our viewers and uh, we've got questions from all over the country. And we're just gonna dive right in. I'm gonna start with this question um, for Aubrey from Wendy in Alabama. <laughs> and, uh, we're starting off with a bang. <laughs> I think you no-kill people are delusional. And I'll just, why is it the people who endorse killing are always so rude. <laughs> I think you know kill people are delusional. Our shelter takes in 20 to 30 owner surrender dogs a day. It's clear the irresponsible public does not care, so we have to destroy animals. There's no choice. What's your magic solution? I have heard this so many times, even as recently as Friday, um, that shelters in Alabama have no choice but to take in owner surrendered animals, and that's just not true. Um, municipally funded tax, you know, tax run shelters, um, they're no more obligated to, to take people's animals than let's say, and I, I hate to use this equation, but let's say that, a, a, a somebody that handles trash is obligated to take, you know, old computers or own cars or whatever. It's just, it, 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 the shelter cannot be seen as the dumping ground for owned animals. Now, having said that, um, most progressive shelters do work with the public. I mean, if somebody comes in and they want to surrender their animal, that really, rather than just saying, oh, yeah, we'll take them, we're going to take them on back and destroy them, but there really needs to be a conversation to find out why the animal is being surrendered, what is going on, to see if there is some other alternative to surrender, and even if there is no other alternative to surrender, which I think is really actually fairly rare, um, then that shelter can have a waiting list. Um, if a shelter is just an open door for anyone to come and surrender their animals at any time, there's no way to control the, the number of animals in the shelter. So uh, p some people may think that, that shelters are obligated to take on animals, but they, they just are not. Um, and so it's up to the shelter to say, time out, let's slow down, and let's figure out what's going on. So we're not really delusional. We just well, want shelters there, to course, do a better job. Different and of course, there's different ways of taking in owner surrendered animals, as you said. But I just want to emphasize the point. You know, you, you know, you, you. There are, by the way, hundreds of open admission no kill animal control shelters. So obviously, it's possible. Um, but the way they do that is critically important um, because you know, is many of the people who come to surrender animals are having problems with animals that can actually be solved. And if the shelter just takes those animals and kills them, it doesn't help those people solve those. Right. Problems. And you so, can end anyway, up with, a, with a recurring thing. Somebody surrenders an animal, no questions are asked. Six months later, they go get another animal. And they're, they're actually apt to be repeat offenders if you're not getting to the heart of what's going they haven't on. Learned, right. Because... Because they haven't learned right. anything. The shelter hasn't taught them anything other than the fact that they're there to take their Correct. pets. <laughs> and anyway, um, from Steve um, in Utah for David, um, I get materials all the time. Oh, I love this question. <laughs> I get materials all the time from the Humane Society of the United States and the American Society for the Protection of Cruelty to ASPCA, Best Friends Animal Society, you know, the other alphabet soup organizations. I used to donate, but over time I've wondered what my money is really being used for. With the millions of dollars these organizations have collectively, why are we not yet a no-kill society? It seems like an awful lot of money goes to things other than keeping animals alive. Oh, well, yeah, there's a lot in that question. <laughs> uh, the, first thing, <laughs> the first thing is, uh, is is that these organizations, they get large, just like corporations, as they get larger, they don't really necessarily get more efficient. Um, 
and they can't target things the way they do. I actually do believe in actually looking real local. No Kill Colorado, obviously, is looking at one state. We don't work outside of the state. Um, and we actually get criticized for that uh, sometimes. But what the way I explain it to people is that because we stay inside our state, we actually can have knowledge of what we're doing, the money that we spend or send spent on resources that are very specific so that donors know exactly what we're doing inside the state. When you're a national organization, <clears throat> first of all, it's a lot harder to figure out where you're actually going to spend the money. Secondly, they become kind of bloated. Um, uh, quite often, they lose their their uh, their way. When you look at some of the alphabet soup uh, organizations that were named by uh, by Steve, what we see is they're spending a lot of money on lobbying. There's a lot of money going into law, and um, and things like that. And so, I, you know, I highly recommend. The, you know, I, I I realize that those organizations people see and they're like, well, they do this, they do that, and these are things I really like. There's someone doing that in your community, and I think you're better off putting it in money where you actually know who's running the organization. Um, you know, most, most local organizations are much smaller. You can actually meet the director, meet the president, and actually know what's happening with your money and track it all the way through uh, to right where it's going to life saving. So... You know. Well, and you, as a perfect example of that, I mean, you, I mean, and I'll just say, I don't necessarily have an issue with lobbying. It's important that animal advocates have a voice um, in yeah. legislatures nationally and locally. But the amounts of money that they spend, um, you know, on their executive salaries, for example, and marketing and promotion and fundraising become really exorbitant. I mean, the last I saw um, in terms of salaries for at the ASPCA and HSUS, for example, I mean, they were paying, I mean, $500,000 for a CEO salary. I'm sorry, if you need that kind of salary to advocate for animals, you're in it for the wrong reason, in my opinion. I, sorry. I was at a fundraiser um, last night from Max Fund here in Denver. It's a great shelter. And, you know, one of the things they said um, uh, on a video that they were showing at the fundraiser is, you know, 80, I think it was 87 cents on the dollar goes to their mission. Um, you know, there's always a certain amount of money that you have to put aside for, for fundraising and for administrative fees. But, you know, it should be, you know, under 15 percent for most organizations, big organizations. And it's not. It's far, it's far more than that. If you want your dollar to go far, put it locally in a small organization. Right, right, very good. So this quite next question is for Alan from Mike in Delaware. Um, the answer is obviously mandatory spay neuter. If people had their pets sterilized, there wouldn't be so many pets in animal shelters in the first place. Why don't you people who claim to know the answer see the obvious solution? <laughs> okay, well, Mike, well, well, Mike, thanks for your question, um, and I appreciate your enthusiasm. Um, and honestly, it's actually um, it's actually something that we hear all the time, even from people who are, claim to be no-kill advocates. Um, but yeah. mandatory spay and neuter um, actually is probably one of the most uniting issues of animal welfare, meaning almost all the traditional animal welfare groups and the no-kill organizations and, and groups all agree that mandatory spay and neuter is completely counterproductive. Um, just just groups that I've seen oppose uh, mandatory spay and neuter would be, of course, all of us have here, uh, the No-Kill Advocacy Center, the ASBCA, Best Friends, uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association, and even the American Kennel Club. Um, and the reason is simple. Um, when you have mandatory spay and neuter, you're basically take dogs uh, or cats out of their homes where they're ha actually happy and bring them to a shelter. And given that most shelters in this country are not no kill, that means they kill more. Uh, the best example I saw was a, from a group called Spay Neuter Kansas City. This group, all they do is try to get animals spayed neutered, and they oppose mandatory spay neuter. And they actually cited evidence from Kansas City after a mandatory spay neuter law was put in place for pit bulls in Kansas City. So mm -hmm. in 2005, uh, before the law went into effect, the, the city shelter killed 981 pit bulls. In 2006, when they enacted the law, the number of pit bulls killed in the shelter increased to 1,353. Mm -hmm. And in 2007, the first full year after the 
mandatory spay and neuter law was in effect, they killed 1,722 mm -hmm. pit bulls. So mm -hmm. it's clear evidence that mandatory spay and neuter increases killing, increases cost to taxpayers, and is and obviously destroys uh, family bonds with their animals. So uh, it's really, while it sounds like a good idea, it's really just a completely terrible one. And, and I'd like to add something onto that, Hi. Helen, because I, I, I do, I work in the legal field and we do municipal defense. Here's, here's my take on it too. If you're prepared to spend money on a law that's punitive, which punishes people, which would include administrative time, court time, um, time, you know, seizing people's animals and taking them to the shelter and then holding them in the shelter and then destroying them. If you're prepared to spend X amount of money, you're better off to take that same amount of money and just make spay and neuter easier for people, whether it's developing a program to help low income families or even it's a program to help, help anyone regardless of income. Why, why take money that, to use it to punish people when you can use that same money and just help people do the right thing? And, and also, I'd say is well, and also I'd to, say is that it depends on the community too. Like, there's some communities where I always people say mandatory spay and neuter here in New Jersey, and to me that would be a completely waste of money, even if it was put in high volume spay and neuter at least for dogs, because you know we we don't have an overpopulation of dog issues in our shelters. We have an issue with killing dogs for behavior, treatable behavior issues. So the money would be better spent for that. I mean, obviously spay and neuter for cats is still important because of KNR. But it's also, I think, a, a decision where I think a lot of people automatically think there's pet overpopulation and they, and they just get attracted to this mandatory spay neuter idea, which often is not even needed from an intake perspective. So obviously there are places where it is needed, but um, in many places, the money is better spent on live release programs. Well, I would argue I don't think mandatory spay and neuter is needed. Spay and neuter might be needed. There's evidence that actually that suggests, you know, in other parts of the world, there are countries where oh, generally spaying and neutering a pet is considered a form of mutilation. And so they just generally don't do it. Um, I think spay and neuter is important for a variety of reasons in the United States. Um, we have some, issue, you know, cultural issues that make that likely to be true, but making it mandatory is just another punitive thing. And the culture in animal control, the reason the killing happens is because animal control is too punitive. Mm -hmm. They want reasons to seize animals. They're hyper controlling and giving them yet another reason to seize animals and kill them is just going to lead to more killing. It seems obvious to me. Anyway, moving on. Um, this is kind of just, I'm going to put this out to the whole group and this is from Patricia. Patricia in California. How does a fairly large no-kill contingent within a medium-sized city persuade a recalcitrant mayor and city council that we the people want a no-kill shelter? Now, Long Beach, California has been fighting this battle for years. Well, um, I'll just say, Patricia, thank you for that great question. And yes, we followed the goings-on in Long Beach. Um, they're mirrored in you know, communities all across the United States. Um, and before anybody else weighs in, I just have to say, you know, what this is, is it's a social change movement. You know, we talked in the last, answering the last question about, um, you know, the culture change that's required, um, you know, for animal control to stop killing animals. That really is what it is. What's needed is a culture change and that's social change. And so you've got to just get loud and persistent and vocal and professional to get as many people. If you can find one advocate on the city council, one person within the mayor's office that will help you move your message forward and then just be persistent, um, you know, <laughs> just keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, I've been fighting this battle in Minneapolis, Minnesota for 20 mm -hmm. years. And for the first time last month, the city of Minneapolis Animal Control reached a live release rate of 94 wow. percent. First time ever anywhere near that range. So I can tell you it can be exhausting and it's painful and difficult. But if you're persistent and you keep that message going, the, the conversation will only go one direction. Well, and I, what is that? What? Uh, what? I, I, I was going to say, in addition to trying to find an ally on the city council, I mean, we have to remember that these are elected officials and that they are public servants. And if it turns out that the people that are in elected positions are not um, following the will of the people, then we need to try to focus on getting people in there that would 
follow the will of the people. And I think that part of that too is keeping the public fully engaged. And that's the part that can be exhausting and take a lot of time. You have to keep this subject out there in the public. Even though we, we would like to think everybody's fully informed on what's happening in Long Beach, they may not be. And we have to consistently keep that message going so that they understand, hey, look, you're paying for this, whether you know it or not. And if you don't like it, speak up. And if you don't like it, let's get people in office that are going to follow the will of the people. And you're going to be doing that in the context of people who are going to try to deflect responsibility for the killing from animal control. It's going to be friends of animal control. It's going to be staff within animal control are going to stir stuff up on Facebook. They're going to try to say, oh, it's not our fault that we're killing animals. It's the irresponsible public. Well, the thing I always think about is like, how would we feel about Mother Teresa mm -hmm. if she had said, wow, there's just too many kids in, Al <laughs> in Calcutta and they're just really not having... So, you know, we're just going to have to start for mercy's sake, you know, taking them out the back door in body bags, you know, how would that have worked out? Not, it wouldn't have. There's no other, you know, uh, you know, entity that can take the victims that they care for and kill them and say that that's somehow merciful. And we just, you said, but you're going to be faced with that as you take this on. And you've got to pre be prepared to just deal with it day after day after day. And it will likely be years because social change, public education takes years. But anyway, very good question. Thank you, Patricia. Moving on, this is um, back to Aubrey from Margie in Florida. How can high kill shelters be turned into no kill shelters? My heart breaks every time I read about an animal who was killed because there were uh, they were in the shelter for too long, were too old. I could go on and on. In most cases, it's not euthanasia. It's out and out killing. Please let's call it what it is and stop using the term euthanasia so blatantly. Again, there's a lot in that question to unpack, but um, what do you have to say, um, Aubrey, to Margie? I would say, Margie, that you're exactly right, that, that more often than not, it's not euthanasia. I mean, I think anybody who's ever had to make a decision about a beloved animal who was suffering um, or, or just no, no treatment could help them. Um, sometimes we make decisions and we have those animals euthanized for reasons of mercy. That personal decision for a beloved pet and what happens in most animal shelters with healthy and treatable animals, they're not the same thing. One is euthanasia, one is not. In terms of getting back to the bigger question of how do we make this change, um, and this is something that we in this group and a lot of people nationally, um, over and over and over again, we talk about this thing called the no-kill equation. It really is a one-size-fits-all DIY type of solution that can fit the needs in any community to help reduce shelter intake, increase shelter output. Um, now, even though the solution is known and has been known really for a very long time, um, trying to get the people that run those shelters to listen and pay attention, that, that can be another challenge. And what we tell people is um, educate themselves, learn about what's happening in their community, learn absolutely about the programs of the no-kill equation, and then as a first step, approach those officials and say, hey, we'd like to help you do a better job. Um, we think that there are things we could do in this community to change. And if those in charge are not interested in, in looking at the no-kill equation or just simply say, oh, no, you're naive, you're a zealot, we don't have to listen to you, that's when you have to circle back to the issues like they're having in Long Beach where you have to really get the public involved, explain to them what's happening with their money, and make it a, a, a public issue where people will speak out. But, again, back to the no-kill equation. And you can find information about the no-kill equation on the website for the No-Kill Advocacy Center for no-kill learning, no-kill movement, I cover it on my website, Pause for Change. Um, I cover it in, in the book that I wrote about what we did in Huntsville. So educate yourself first, but then just come up with a plan, stay on subject, and just keep pushing. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Very well said. Um, and this next question is um, for Alan from Tina in Georgia. There's some similarities to this question, but there's an interesting little hook at the end that's unique and different, and I'm really fascinated to hear Alan's take on this slight change to this question. Um, it says, I volunteer in a shelter near me. It's typical for dogs to be euthanized because they start acting crazy um, after they've been there for a while. Um, they pace or bark, they show their teeth, um, and they're destroyed to prevent suffering mentally. Um, that's humane, right? Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> well, as you see here, and as you, see, Again. as you can see here, I'm, uh, my cat and I are, are having a moment uh, while I answer this question. So that may give a preview of what my answer will be. Um, so um, 
First of all, I emphasize with the, the issue, I, I volunteered at two regressive shelters where uh, kennel stress and dogs declining for behavior reasons was a huge issue. Um, so I, I, I get it. Um, so basically there's a lot, lot of things shelters can do to significantly reduce and even potentially eliminate uh, these problems. So first off, what I would suggest to any shelter is Implement the no-kill equation because you're going to reduce the average length of stay for almost all of your dogs dramatically. So they may not be in the shelter long enough for these um, pr the behavior problems to occur. Um, the other thing, you, the other things you can do besides that is implement large-scale play groups. So there's a group called Dogs Playing for Life, and they come to shelters and do. They don't just like throw dogs into a play yard and say have at it. They um, they they implement a structured program where they match all the dogs. Uh, they help the shelter match the dogs together, and um, they develop play groups where the dogs um, actually um, are able to interact and expend lots of energy. And when they expend lots of energy, um, they're able to uh, really um, behave better in the shelter. They come back to their kennels and they're exhausted. And everyone knows a tired dog is a well-behaved dog. So uh, they have a lot of success with this. They're able to get almost all dogs into play groups, at least with certain dogs, even dogs that were previously thought as dog aggressive. So that would be like number one to do in terms of enrichment. Uh, the other thing shelters can do, if they're having dogs spend a lot of time in the shelter, um, they can implement what Austin Pets Live has done, which is a, a canine good citizens training program where um, volunteers basically train the dogs to pass this canine good citizen uh, behavior test or temperament test. And the dogs are then marketed as uh, canine good citizen dogs or canine good citizen trained dogs. And this obviously makes the dogs uh, better behaved in the shelter because they're spending energy doing something. And also, um, they're great. It's, it's dramatically reduces the length of stay of these dogs because the, sh the shelter markets these dogs, and people are really, really um, uh, attracted to dogs with these uh, with this type of training. And finally, really, the the most important another important thing shelters can do is foster programs. So, um, Fairfax County Animal Shelter in 2015 or so did a study where they took basically all the dogs they were going to kill, or most of the dogs they were going to kill for behavior, and put them into foster homes. And what they, so they had things like, the dogs had things like kennel stress, dog reactivity, uh, some elements of aggression, and what they found is 90% of these dogs that were placed in foster homes were ultimately adopted into permanent homes. So it shows you that a lot of these dogs that we think are having problems in the shelter and unadoptable really are. Um, and even if you can't do a full-fledged, uh, you can't find full-fledged uh, semi-permanent fosters, uh, you can do overnight fosters or weekend fosters. Uh, there was just a study this year uh, in a journal called Peer J, um, where they found that placing dogs in an overnight or weekend foster home dramatically reduced cortisol levels or stress hormones in these dogs. And uh, they found that, yes, when the dogs went back to the shelter, stress levels did go back up, but it was akin to like someone working a stressful job during the week and then going home to um, rest, have rest and relaxation and recharge their batteries. So when they come back in on Monday, they're, they're able to work again. And so even short-term fosters can really be beneficial for shelters. Um, well, and again, you know, I'll just say this. I mean, it's, it's, it seems obvious to me again that, um, Dogs that are ha going deteriorating in the shelter are deteriorating in the shelter because the shelter isn't providing for their needs, yeah. which isn't humane. Exactly. You know, and you don't kill animals because you're not providing what they need and call it humane. Absolutely. Um, that's the opposite of what animal shelters should be doing. And so, you know, what animal shelters should do is provide th what those animals need. And there's a whole host of reasons with a little creative thought. I've heard of, you know, 
you know, for the really active, boisterous dogs, those that don't do well in kennels so much, there's running programs yeah. where they invite runners to come yeah. out and take dogs running. You know, I set up a biking program, which is really amazing, um, which it, it's got some very specific things you need to make sure it's safe for the dogs and the people, but it works great. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do for those dogs to provide their needs rather than killing them. And if you're going to be a shelter, your job is to provide their needs, not to yep. kill them. Um, for David, um, this is from Jeanette in New York. Um, how are people to make the decision? How I'm, I'm sorry. How are the people that make the decisions in the shelters appointed? And what can we do to get the worst slash bad ones replaced? That's a great question. Yeah, well, and the first one, of course, is complicated. It depends on where you are, right? Whether it's a nonprofit, yeah. whether it's a, um, a tax-funded shelter, um, those are all different ways. So what you do need to do is actually figure that out. Is the city council, uh, county commissioner responsible for that? Is it a private foundation with a board that you can actually approach? Um, is it simply just a, a an executive director that really has the reins over all the decisions that are made, which is usually where it, where it goes, but they often answer to somebody else. And quite often that is the way to actually facilitate change um, uh, there. But um, this kind of goes back to uh, something that we were talking about on our previous question. It really is persistence. Uh, one of the things when I talk to advocates that are trying to change that community, the one thing I say in the first meeting every time is that this is a long game you can't give up that is generally what the opposition is always going to be trying to do to you they're just waiting for you to give up they're waiting to tire you out and you have to play that game the other way you have to keep going until they give up or you tire them out to actually get the change the difference is is you're trying to tire them out to save lives. They're trying to tie you out just so you go away and they don't have to deal with you. So, um, you know, I just recommend you you have to find out from, usually from the website, you can find out if there's a board of directors or if they're actually run by the city and you can start tracking down those people that way and approach them first. I mean, I always approach the people that are responsible. There have been, you know, uh, examples of where those people, once they talk to someone, uh, who actually says, you know, you could change and things could be better. They'll actually, they could actually turn it around. Most of the time, you have to go to battle and you just have to persist. You cannot give up. Yeah, and yeah, I would argue there's a challenge because what happens is these shelter directors, you know, whether they're nonprofit or whether they're uh, public, um, they are considered to be the experts that either the board of directors looks to or the county board, county commission, um, city council looks to to give them advice and so when there's issues with animals they're the people they go to for information and that dynamic you know continues to kick in so when people come to complain they go back to those very people who are being complained about for advice on what to do and that automatically sets up a challenge that we have to get well, through which is why we as advocates need to be educated we need to be um, informed and we need to be articulate passionate but not you know too extreme in our language because it's a, again a long game we don't want to anger anybody we don't need to anger we need to bring as many people to the table as we can yeah and it wasn't um, really actually, it wasn't really part of the question, but it goes back to what Aubrey said. You've got to educate yourself. Go out there. Start with the basics. The no-kill equation, like she said, no-kill learning, uh, no-kill advocacy center, no-kill movement. Um, uh, Aubrey's uh, uh, blog is fantastic, Pause for Change. Um, there's plenty of information out there, but go out there, learn the basics, so you actually have a command of the subject when you walk in. You can't just walk in and say, you know, you're murderers, you have to stop. They, that, that really doesn't work. That kind of language doesn't work. You have to go in there and show them why you know what they're doing is wrong, but there are solutions to the problem. And this is, thanks, that's just great advice, David. Thank you so much. This one I'm going to just kind of put out to the group, but I have to say something about it because there's, a, there's an example that I was personally involved in that, you know, really hits close to home. Um, um, this is from Christopher in Texas. Um, um, I know uh, there's a shelter in my county, but it's not open to the public. 
uh, how are people supposed to help if they can't get to get to the people who are running the shelter, if they can't get the people who are running the shelter to listen? And I would argue, oh, yeah, and how can you, you know, make a difference if you can't get in to find your pets or whatever? Um, yeah, the most interesting example of this um, actually happened when I was brought in to Scottsboro, Alabama, we're, we're right next door practically to you, Aubrey, um, years ago. And uh, what I found was they had a kill rate at the animal control shelter there. It was almost 90%. Um, it wasn't because they were bad people. Uh, it was really um, just that they hadn't thought of anything different. For years and years and years, they had this attitude that the job, the animal control job, as described and defined, was to go round up stray animals and kill them. And so they had, I think it was four or five animal control officers that were considered field officers, and they would get into their animal control vehicles, and they would be out throughout the county um, in the area. It was all split up. And when they caught an animal, they would bring it back to the shelter, put it in a kennel, and go back out. And so there was never any organized time when anybody would answer the phone at the animal shelter. The animals were just sitting in there. Um, they would get cared for very early in the morning, and then the field officers would go out. And and that's what they thought the job was. Nobody ever sat back and thought about doing it differently. And so literally after the presentation, I actually, Kelly Jedlitschke from um, No Kill uh, Kentucky Pets Alive and I presented there. And shortly after that meeting, we ended up going around and meeting with the city council and the mayor. And, and within a matter of, you know, days literally after that realization that they all they had to do was shuffle things around a little bit so that there was always an animal control officer at the shelter to answer the phones let the public in coordinate with rescue groups their live release rate went from like less than 10 percent or around 10 percent to up around 85 90 percent practically overnight just by making that one simple change didn't cost them any money they just reorganized a little bit of course you have to be open to the public you have to be able to let people see in and you've got to find a way of getting the people who are making those decisions to look at their policies, practices, and protocols. And oftentimes that requires somebody from outside to come in with, you know, that doesn't have the blinders on of the history of the way things have always been. And they need to be willing to, you know, do that. And usually you can find some quick, simple solutions to save a lot more lives very quickly. I, I would say also, and, and um, we see this, um, and Scottsboro is a perfect example, Michael, all they had to do is make one simple change. We know of shelters that are only open when people are at work. And um, as long as you're in the business of trying to keep animals in homes or get animals back, back home or into new homes, you simply have to have hours so that people can get there. I mean, if you're only open from nine to five and it takes, I don't know, let's say half an hour to reclaim an animal, let alone travel time to going back home or to an adopt an animal where you need to have time to meet that animal, get adoption counseling. I mean, it takes time. If you're only open from nine to five, you're, you're telling people you have to take vacation time to do this. Or if there are some people that don't get vacation time, or maybe they only have a half an hour lunch break. I mean, simply shifting the hours of operation uh, to an hour or even two hours later by opening an hour or two hours later means that people can get there when you're open and you reduce the number of animals in the building. I mean, it seems counterintuitive to complain, oh, we don't have adopters, oh, people aren't reclaiming their animals. Well, guess what? If you're not open when people can get there, obviously, whose fault is that? You have to be open. <laughs> right. Well, Which I mean, is kind of ironic because the very next question is for Alan, okay. <laughs> and it's from Shirley in New Mexico. I'd like to volunteer at my mm -hmm. local shelter, but they're only open during hours when people are at work. I can't even get there to volunteer. How would people? How in the world are people supposed to find their lost or pets or go into an adopt an animal? <laughs> it seems counterproductive to only be open from nine to five. I know people who work jobs with no vacation time and who get you know only a half hour you know for lunch break. There's no way they can go to their shelter uh, and keep their job. Sorry, sorry Alan, course, didn't mean to true. step on the next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just it, all of this stuff is so interconnected. So anyway, um, well, so you, I, and I know you were about to jump in anyway, Alan, so just go ahead and sure. You, what do you got? Well, I, I would say it's something, I, I think it's something that you said once, Mike, where when you ran a shelter that um, 
you, to, you basically are incurring all these costs anyway to keep the shelter open, to clean and care for the animals. And it doesn't cost much more to have someone in to process adoptions or owner reclaims or have volunteers help and assist the shelter. So, so there's really no logical reason why you would sit there and close the shelter up in, close the shelter up to potential sources of revenue. And, and I think many other people may not realize, but opportunities to reduce costs because um, when you're getting animals out quicker, you're going to have shorter average lengths of stay. That means you're spending less on feeding and caring for animals. You're going to have lower disease rates, which is going to re- uh, decrease future veterinary costs. So there's really no reason um, to keep the shelter closed to the public. Um, so, if I were the, the person asking this question, I would say, go to your city council and say, look, you're costing taxpayers money because you're, you're drying up revenue sources and you're increasing sheltering costs. So let us come in, let us help the animals, and let's get them out of there alive. Well, here's an interesting way to look. Here's an interesting way to look at it. You know, there are shelters who um, don't provide any animal care after they close in the evening, which I would argue if they close at five o'clock and then they don't open again until seven o'clock in the morning, they may think that that's cost effective because they've got that huge amount of time where there's no staff in the building. But I guarantee you the shelters that operate that way have a much bigger mess to clean up in the morning. And the amount of labor and time that they're spending you know, when they are there is much work is much more, um, you know, if they if they spread that out so that the animals are getting more outdoor time. So the dogs are outside and they're not going to the bathroom in their kennels, they're cleaning and the maintenance of the building is much easier. And so and if there's going to be people there spread out more, then you can be open to the public more. It doesn't even really have to cost you that much more money, if at all. And so um, there's just really no excuse. Again, it goes back to sitting down and objectively looking at not just the way you've always done it, but, you know, what's possible with the resources that you're spending now today so that you can stay open and people can come in and help. I mean, to, um, and well, so, tomorrow is Veterans Day. It's any any last, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, uh, I was just saying, know, any last thoughts? Yeah, just businesses do that. I mean, you know, there there are lots of restaurants that close on Mondays or Tuesdays because it would be the least busy time anyway. And but they make sure they're open on Friday and Saturday, which are their busiest times. Um, and it should be looked at that way. It's that sim- It could be that simple. They could they could spend the exact same amount of time and just close on a day that people are are not available to come to them anyway and work Saturday and Sunday. There are businesses around the world that work every day of the week. So why, why wouldn't this be any different? Well, and what yeah, I, was I, would say, animal I would say, I would say I, one animal thing. Adoptions is a, sorry. Animal adoptions is a retail business. I'm sorry, it just is. Yeah, and I'd say, right. and I'd say unlike a restaurant where, you know, when you're closed, you're not incurring too many costs anyway. A shelter is already incurring tons of costs, even when it's closed to the public because they have people in there cleaning, caring, and even providing veterinary care to animals. So, you know, you're you're right. you're, you're not really incurring many more incremental costs just to process of uh, owner reclaims and, and adoptions and and have volunteers help. So, I think it's even stronger case than say a restaurant because the incremental costs are just minimal and the incremental well, revenues are, 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 are high. I know that people will be well, at my animal all. shelter tomorrow because it's Veterans Day. They're going to be there anyway. They're going to be doing paperwork. They're going to be taking animals outside. They're going to be cleaning. They could very easily be open even for a three-hour period because they're going to have people in the building anyway. And, I mean, they could make, you know, freedom adoptions or something, and, and you, they could get animals out. So, um, But they won't be open. It's just a lost opportunity. So all really good thoughts. Thank you all for participating. Thank you to our viewers and listeners for uh, sending in your questions. Periodically, we're going to come back and do these sorts of uh, questions, Q&As. So if you've got questions, go ahead and leave them in the comments. Uh, If you want to subscribe, be sure to like, subscribe at the link. And thanks for watching. 